Hello, and welcome to My Week in Baseball. I'm your host, Phil Eshtruth Harrison. You're listening to episode number 14. Recent episodes are published in podcast format on Buzzsprout, Spotify, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio, while all episodes are available in a video version on YouTube, so you have many ways to enjoy the show. As always, thanks to Ari Eshtruth of Brunjo Productions for the intro music created especially for this show. Learn more at brunjo.com. Today, we'll talk about batters clowning around, the touchy subject of minor league pay, a recent Inside the Park Grand Slam home run, pitching strategy from 1960s all-star catcher Tom Haller, and an interesting situation when the Kansas City Royals recently visited Toronto. Of course, we'll also have a timely blimmerick, our blast from the past, and the cup of the day. So let's get right to it. Okay, today's cup of the day. You heard that right. It's cup, not cap. And that's because recently, when I visited a local Dairy Queen, they served the soft drinks in a cup with all 30 Major League Team logos on it and a 31st logo, as you might guess, the DQ logo. Uh, I'd actually think it's a pretty clever cup. It's kind of a pale blue, and it's got a, a DQ logo in the middle that says inside the cup home run, I guess, instead of inside the park, which we're actually going to talk about later in this episode. Uh, and it has every team logo. I actually counted them and went through to make sure uh, all the logos were there. But I think it's pretty clever. And uh, I only wish that they would do it rather than in a paper cup in an actual reusable cup. Anyway, so that is today our cup of the day. Thanks, Dairy Queen. Okay, now from the fun department, Victor Robles just clowning around. Recently, Victor Robles of the Washington Nationals hit a home run against Madison Bumgarner of the Arizona Diamondbacks in a game that wasn't really close at all. At the time he hit the home run, I believe it was seven to one. The game ended up seven to two. So the Nationals were losing handily anyway. And Robles stood and admired his deep wallop for a few seconds and got a lot of grief from pitcher Madison Bumgarner, who apparently has had issues with other players in the past whenever they stand for more than a second looking at their home run. In fact, Bumgarner said he looked like a clown, referring to Victor Robles. So the very next day, Robles shows up in his dugout wearing what? A bright red clown nose. So I guess that's good for revenge or good to show that Robles doesn't take it too seriously after all. And if you check out baseballreference.com and look up Victor Robles, every player has a little picture uh, in the upper corner showing that player. And the current picture on baseballreference.com is the one of Robles with the red clown nose. So pretty clever. I think Bumgarner probably should lighten up in this case. It wasn't a close game. It didn't really matter. I'm sure it's frustrating to give up a home run, but you're winning the game, and that's really the important part. And I did watch the replay. Robles does stand for several seconds uh, and watches it go out, but he really walloped it. It was a clear home run. It wasn't something that might have been borderline or at the wall where he really needed a run. So honestly, I don't blame him. And you do see pitchers celebrate fairly often, uh, even in a minor way. If you get a, a, a key strikeout in an important inning, you know, they kind of do the hoo with their with their hand or yell or uh, make some kind of emotion. And I don't see any problem with batters occasionally doing that if it doesn't go over the top. So anyway, hats off to Victor Robles for not taking himself too seriously and for having fun with the term clowning around. Now on to something to honk about. Rob Manfred, Major League Baseball Commissioner, 
on minor league pay recently said, quote, I kind of reject the premise of the question that minor league players are not paid a living wage. Interesting to me that he used the phrase kind of. He didn't actually say I outright reject it. He says I kind of reject it. And he was basing that not on the amount minor league players are paid, which as I'll show in a minute, is quite minimal. He was also basing it on some other things. He was citing signing bonuses that many of the minor league players have, which in some regards I think is true, especially if you're a top draft pick, you are getting large signing bonuses. So maybe the pay doesn't matter too much, but there are many players who get very minimal signing bonuses. Um, he also cited a housing provided by the teams, which, okay, housing is a benefit uh, granted, at the same time, you're kind of locking the player in and forcing them to be in the housing because you don't pay them enough to go out and find their own apartment. Anyhow, Manfred and the major leagues ahead of the 2021 season cut 40 teams from minor leagues, uh, leaving 120 affiliates. And the idea was that they could then spend more money on the affiliates they had left if they cut out uh, some of the teams that apparently were uh, deemed unnecessary. And they did increase minor league salaries in the range of 40 to 70%, which sounds like a lot. But again, as I'll discuss in a moment, the dollar amounts we're talking are surprisingly low. And so even with those raises, many minor league players make less than $20,000 a year with zero coming to them during the off season. So um, many of those players, I think, unless they receive an exceptional signing bonus or, you know, top 10 player, first or second, third, maybe third round draft pick, they're going to have to have another job to get by uh, during the offseason. Let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, first off, recently, a class action lawsuit was settled that awards $185 million to minor league players, which uh, amounts to about $5,000 per player. Uh, if they were part of that group. Um, and more importantly, it includes a provision that Major League Baseball will drop rules that prevent teams from paying minor leaguers during the offseason, something they had set up in the rules so that one team wouldn't start doing it, kind of forcing all the other teams to do it. Anyway, now let's take a look at the, the salaries themselves. If we Let's start out by just knowing that federal minimum wage for quite a while has been $7.25 an hour. Wages prior to 2021, so this is a new agreement, so changes have recently been made, but 20, prior to 2021, if you were a rookie in the uh, or you were in the, uh, the, the short A ball season, you're making $290 a week. And they always quote things in weekly amounts, which I think makes it a little harder to tell what they're talking about. So how many hours do you think a minor league player works during the week? Well, let's just say it's 40 hours. I'm sure it's probably far more than that. If you count all the workouts and the training that goes on as well, it could be 60, 70, maybe more. But let's just say it was 40 hours. So if you're making $290 a week, you divide that by 40 hours, it comes out to $7.25 an hour. So at that rate, rookies and short a-ball season players were making federal minimum wage. Uh, A-ball, same amount, $7.25 an hour. Double A, woohoo, up to $8.75 an hour. Look at that. Wow. They're really raking it in. And if you made it to triple A, you were making $12.55 an hour up through the 2020 season. Compare that to the major leagues where the minimum salary uh, at that time was $545,000 which breaks down to approximately 260 bucks an hour. So the major league players are making like attorney level pay, even at the low end, while the minor league players are barely making enough to scrape by and arguably not enough to scrape by. So what changed with the uh, new agreement? Uh, so the rookie uh, class A pay went from the equivalent of 725 an hour to 10 bucks an hour, woo woo. Uh, a ball, the full length A ball season went from 725 to 1250 an hour. Double A went from 875 an hour to 15 bucks an hour. Triple A 
went from 1255 to 1750 an hour. So AAA players still making 1750 an hour. Now I know it depends on what state you live in, but we certainly in our area see um, many fast food restaurants and other kind of uh, frontline retail type of jobs, entry level or just a little above entry level that are offering pay anywhere from 14, 15, 16, 17, even $18 an hour. So to be in the middle to high teens, at least in our area, you're making the equivalent of a triple A player. And you're only getting that while the season is going on. So uh, kind of interesting. Uh, so federal minimum wage 725, but the states have minimum wages that vary quite a bit. Although commonly they're in the, uh, roughly 10 to $12 an hour is fairly common right now for state minimum wage. So you, if you think of that, the only two divisions that are making above that are AA and AAA at $15 an hour and $17.50 an hour. Uh, by the way, the uh, major league minimum for this year, for 2022, is now $700,000, which by my math works out to $336 an hour. So even probably better than many attorneys. Next up, the Blue Jays wall up the Boston Red Sox 28 to 5. Now, the really interesting thing about this game is that Blue Jays outfielder Raimel Tapia hits a fly ball to center field, and the Boston Red Sox outfielder, center fielder Jaron Duran, loses the ball completely. It bounces 30 feet past him up against the wall and rumbles around in the outfield. And did I neglect to mention that the bases were loaded at the time this ball was hit? So round and round the bases race the Toronto runners and the Red Sox are stumbling around trying to pick up the ball. And it turns out that Tapia gets an inside the park grand slam home run. And the question I had, has that ever happened before? Have you ever heard of a grand slam inside the park home run? So the answer is yes. There have actually been more than, if you can believe this, 200 inside the park grand slams dating back to the 1880s. In fact, this is the second one in Blue Jay history, and it is the first one in the majors in five years. So not common, but not incredibly uncommon either. Congratulations to the Blue Jays for their romp over the Red Sox. Next up, pitching strategy. If you're a regular listener, you'll remember that a few episodes ago, I paid tribute to baseball writer Roger Angel and promised to read one of his books, which I recently completed the book called Season Ticket, which covers the late 1970s into the middle to late 1980s. In it, Angel interviews a series of catchers to get their take on how they play the game. And there was a fascinating interview with Tom Holler, a 12 year veteran of the Giants, Dodgers and Tigers who later became an executive for the Giants. So this would have been during his time uh, working in the front office for the Giants. But he was talking about catcher strategy. And this is something that is at a level of detail that makes you understand why the very best players are so very good. He had a strategy of calling pitches when working with his pitching staffs that he would occasionally give a good hitter that hitter's favorite pitch, but he would do it in an unimportant situation designed to maintain a psychological advantage in future situations. As an example, Let's say you had a hitter who was great at hitting, uh, maybe he's a great slider hitter, or maybe he's a great off-speed hitter. And normally, you would stay away from that pitch. If he's an off-speed hitter, you wouldn't normally want to throw him an off-speed pitch, at least not for a strike. But let's say that your team was losing by a lot, or maybe you had a multiple run lead. And nobody's on base. And it's a situation in the game where letting that batter see that pitch that he really likes, maybe even in getting a base hit or better out of it, 
doesn't really hurt your team. And what it does, it sets up in the batter's mind that the next time he's at the plate and any future time he's facing that particular pitcher, he remembers, you know what? Last time I faced this guy, he gave me my favorite pitch. He gave me that off-speed pitch on the outside corner, and I love that. I'm going to sit on that pitch. And if you've got that advantage of him thinking that way, and then a key situation in a ball game comes up where you really want to get him out, where you really need to get him out, then you can stay away from his favorite pitch. And while he waits for it, maybe you throw him a fastball up and in that he doesn't get. You do other things while he's sitting and waiting for that pitch. And I thought, what an interesting strategy to purposely give someone a good pitch to hit, their favorite pitch, so that later on, you can stay away from that pitch. Kudos to Tom Haller for that strategy, and thanks to Roger Angel for recording it for posterity in his book, Season Ticket. So next up, our blast from the past. And this time it will be catcher Tom Haller. Tom Haller played for 12 years, mostly with the San Francisco Giants and the Los Angeles Dodgers. He did play his final season with the Detroit Tigers. He is a one, two, three time all-star and uh, really quite a good offensive catcher, at least. Career batting average is respectable at 257 on base percentage of 340, which is quite good, and an on base plus slugging OPS of 753, which is a very solid OPS for a career OPS plus of 114, meaning, of course, that he's 14% above league average offensively. So quite solid. Uh, he did have a high of 27 home runs for the 1966 San Francisco Giants. That was one of the years that he was an all-star. Uh, he had a high batting average of 286. Uh, that was for the Dodgers in 1970. And he had a really excellent strikeout to walk ratio, something that you don't see much in current major league players. For example, in 1971, he walked 25 times, which isn't a ton, but he only had 202 at bats. So it's very good for that minimal number of at bats. 25 walks and only 30 strikeouts. In other seasons, uh, it was very comparable. Uh, in fact, one year in 1967 for the Giants, he actually walked more than he struck out. He walked 62 times, struck out 61, which gave him, uh, with his 251 batting average that year, it gave him a 344 on base percentage. So, uh, very good strikeout to walk ratio really helped him uh, as an offensive player. And so, kudos to Tom Heller for that and for his creative thinking with pitching strategy. Next up, Royals versus the Blue Jays. In a four-game set that took place July 14 through 17 of this year, 2022, uh, the Jays won three of four games. But that's not really the news here. You would expect them to win three of four when you know what else we're going to discuss here. In fact, you might have expected to win all four because 10 players from Kansas City, 10 out of 26 on the roster, were not allowed into Canada due to their vaccination status. The 10 players were placed on the restricted list, and they did forfeit four days of pay and, major, and four days of Major League service time in accordance with the collective bargaining agreement. And that meant, depending on the player, uh, they lost anywhere between $16,000 for those four days up to $180,000 for Andrew Benatendi, the highest paid of those players. Now, manager Mike Matheny took it all in stride. Uh, quote, he said, now what it presents is an opportunity for some young guys to step in who wouldn't normally be here. I'm excited about some young guys coming in and getting a chance. So true, they did call up a number of players from their minor league teams to fill in for those four games in Toronto. You know, for the Royals, who are not a very good team, who have no chance at all of making the playoffs this year, probably not that big of a deal. 
But if you were a contending team, and certainly contending teams are going in to play games in Toronto, and a few of their players are not allowed to go, but it's not uh, as extreme as it was with the Royals. I think the one thing that affects is possible trades. Um, their outfielder, Andrew Benatendi, has been linked to the Yankees and other playoff contending teams as someone they might like to acquire for their playoff run. In fact, he is having a career year. Uh, Andrew Penatendi is hitting uh, 317 with a 387 on base percentage, 785 OPS, which is 23% better than league average. So he's having really a fantastic year. And he was also an all-star. Uh, and last year, he won a gold glove. He's 27 years old this year. So you can see that he could be a really appealing player to a team uh, looking for some outfield help in the pennant run. But here's the catch. Do you want to trade for a player when there's a chance, especially if you're an American League team, a really good chance that you may end up having to go to Toronto to play at least some of your playoff games? Or if you're in the National League, you might end up having to go to Toronto for a World Series. It's possible. So it's really got to give some teams second thoughts. And one of the players uh, was actually quoted as saying he would reconsider uh, his position on being vaccinated uh, if he had an opportunity to go to a contending team. Or I think maybe it was more in terms of the Royals, if the Royals had an opportunity to uh, to play in the playoffs. Um, but it does just make you think that uh, it does have an effect uh, besides the monetary effect on the teams uh, and their records and uh, the one loss records of really all the teams um, that end up playing Toronto during the season. So I'm going to say thanks to my friend and fantasy baseball rival, uh, David Hall, for bringing up uh, this Canadian situation. And I want to also thank him for today's limerick. That's our baseball limerick that we have every episode. So this Blimerick is for the Royals and the Blue Jays, and this Blimerick was written by my friend, David Hall. And just because Toronto is a little bit of a tricky word to rhyme with, I am going to pronounce it Toronto. So apologies in advance to people from Ontario. The mispronunciation though is intentional in this case. There once was a series in Toronto where the Royals were not very pronto. Ten players didn't vaccinate. Games they could barely coordinate. A faux pas of Canadian fondue. So thanks again to David Hall for today's Blimerick. And lastly, if you didn't have a chance to see the All-Star game recently, I wanted to call out one play that I thought was just outstanding. And in case you missed it, you need to know about it. It was a defensive play made by the American League Keystone Combo of Andre Jimenez from the Cleveland Guardians and Tim Anderson of the Chicago White Sox. There's a runner on first and a ground ball is smacked straight up the middle over the second base bag. Jimenez races to his right and gloves the ball in his left hand. He's a right-handed player, gloves the ball behind the bag, just getting to the ball. He does not have time to turn around to face second base to throw the ball to Tim Anderson, who's coming over from short to get to the bag. So he takes the ball out in his right hand and flips it behind his back to Anderson who catches the ball, deftly touches second base, flips to first for the double play. And it really is a brilliant, brilliant behind the back double play. And I was especially impressed, not just with Jimenez. I mean, what a great play he made, but also to Anderson, because we're talking about two players on different AL teams, on opposing teams in the American League Central Division who don't play together. And that they could in this short time have the wherewithal that Anderson could realize Jimenez was doing this, could get the ball and complete the double play. Just amazing. And that's the kind of thing, who cares if the all-star game doesn't matter 
as far as who wins and who loses. When I get to see great players and great plays like that, it's always worth it. So thank you, MLB. Thank you, Andres Jimenez. And thank you, Tim Anderson, for that amazing, amazing play. So that's all for today, my friends. Join us next week, because honestly, what can be better than talking baseball? Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Phil Eshkuth-Harrison. We'll see you next time on My Week in Baseball. Thank you.